Welcome to the Trail Doc Podcast. I am John Onate, and I have a broad interest in healthcare, mental health, science, and sports, particularly trail and ultra running. I am an academic physician and teacher. In this podcast, I will talk with experts and high achievers who have insights that we all can learn from. Hopefully, we can share information and introduce you to some amazing people that you will find interesting and helpful. This is a work in progress. Please let me know what you think, and I will welcome suggestions for future episodes. Thank you for listening. In this episode, I am joined by a trio of healthcare professionals who are experts in providing medical care and support at trail and ultra marathon races. We have a frank and broad discussion on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on ultra marathons. They are Dr. Andy Pasternak, his wife, Dr. Joanne Elro, and Dr. John Anderson. Andy is a family physician and founder of the Silver Sage Family and Sports Medicine Clinic in Reno. Joanne is an anesthesiologist in Reno. Joanne and Andy are well-known medical dynamo at the Tahoe Trail Endurance Runs in Western States 100, where Andy serves as medical director at both races. John Anderson is not only emergency room physician in Reno and medical director of the Broken Arrow Sky Races, he is also a talented mountain endurance athlete with multiple finishes at the Tour de Jeans. I must also say that Andy and Joanne are outstanding ultra endurance athletes as well, uh, with finishing 100 mile races. And Andy and Joanne are also, and I know this from a personal um, experience, outstanding cross country skiers as well. Enjoy. So, this tells us a little bit about uh, who you are. Um, so, I'm Andy Pasternak, I'm a family practice doc in Reno, Nevada. I've been the medical director for the Tahoe Rim Trail Races for 10 years, and this was supposed to be my first year as medical director for Western States. Uh, I've also helped out at Canyons, the new uh, uh, Ultra Ultra Trails Lake Tahoe. I can never get that one right. Uh, I was medical director there, so uh, we're and have worked at a bunch of races in Nevada, California. And I'm Joanne Ellero. I'm an anesthesiologist in Reno, Nevada. I am assistant to <laughs> the medical director. She's the one that actually gets the shit done. Do um, you have a title at Tahoe Rim? Are you like- I don't. Oh. I'm just a silent uh, background partner, but I usually take care of um, organizing all of the medical um, equipment. Mm. and. Um, of course, volunteering awesome. and pacing sometimes. And, and how long between you two, how long have you been uh, doing medical director work or volunteering at races? Uh, I, think I, I think I started volunteering probably like a year before Andy did. Yeah, she's actually technically been at TRT longer than I have. I so. was at TRT before it became a hundred miler. So. Wow. Uh, and John? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, John Anderson. I'm an emergency medicine physician. And I practice primarily in Reno, Nevada as well. Um, I work in the, in the ski clinic um, up in Lake Tahoe as well. I'm with Truckee. And I work um, right in the medical director for uh, Broken Arrow Sky Race. Um, and I've done that since its inception. Um, then also um, do some um, race medical work with uh, Racing the Planet of Four Deserts, which is kind of a the stage uh, race events that kind of go uh, throughout the world on different uh, in different deserts. Wow! And and how long have you been um, involved in these races as a medical director? Or um, so Broken Arrow. I think we are coming. Let's see. I think this is our this is our fourth or fifth year. I'm trying to remember. Um, and um been there since the beginning and then with racing the planet i think the first year i did with them was 2012 2013 right around there you know i think some people might find it interesting to find out like how um each of you got into it like how did how did you end up in your in those roles uh maybe start with you john since we're talking yeah um well i think you know i i kind of came into it I guess I've been running longer than I've been in medicine I guess I, you know, I grew up running and um, I started running ultras probably I think 16 years ago now um, and it was kind of a natural um, 
uh, mesh of kind of my 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 work and my personal interest as I you know continue to run ultras um, and in and then I just you know I, I think initially I just kind of reached out to um, some of the race organizations um, and you know kind of told them who I was and some of my background and and asked if they needed any help and. Um, you know, as you kind of get started, you know, since usually you find someone that kind of takes you under their wing and kind of helps move you along. Um, and then for um, for Broken Air itself, uh, you know, Brendan's a good friend of mine. He's the, he and, and Ethan started the race, the friends of mine. And um, kind of, actually, I guess the whole race management is, and my brother's part of it and uh, Jeff Quine and all kind of friends that um, just kind of, they approached me and asked me if I wanted to do that as they were getting started. Yeah, and and uh, actually, all all three of my guests today are, are highly accomplished ultra endurance athletes as well. I mean, John, you have an amazing resume. Uh, how many times have you done Tour de Jeanne? Uh I well, so <laughs> I've done it. I um, let's see. I did. I've done Tour de Jeanne three times. I I didn't finish one year, so I completed it twice. And then I did uh, last year. I did Tour de Glaciers, which is the the longer version, the 450k version. So kind of four times in total to the race, but although one year I didn't finish. So. And I forgot, do you do schemo as well? Or I do, yeah, yeah. I just, um, yeah. I mean, kind of living up here, it's uh, we we're we're lucky in that um, there's a few places that are amenable to that, and obviously just you know, getting getting out anywhere is pretty easy here. Got it. Uh, and you know the races have started to pick up locally. You started to see a few more, and they've actually grown and become certified and things like that. But uh, not not this year. <laughs> and uh, Joanne and Andy, how? Uh, what's the story? So it sounds like Joanne was first. Like, what kind of made you decide to not only participate in these ultras, but to, you know, lend your medical expertise to the races? Well, I would say the um, my story and our story, I guess, in a way is very similar to John's. Um, start out running, we were actually both road runners before, kind of got burned out, injured, um, joined the local running club on their, their trail groups, started running on the trails. Um, I think we ran our first ultra in, it was TRT 50K, 55K. It was back when they called it 50K. And I want to say it was like 2004, maybe, or yeah. 2005 Somewhere or six. Yeah. So it was a while ago also. And, you know, since we were friends with people in the club and they were looking for volunteers on weekends where people weren't running and there weren't as many, um, I don't know, it was the same kind of mm -hmm. like... And yeah. Because, because we're physicians and because we're also runners, they needed help at aid stations and it just naturally evolved. Like the first time I worked at TRT at Tunnel Creek, there was basically really no medical the way we see medical now. This is probably at least 15 years ago. It also wasn't, it wasn't a hundred miler. It wasn't a hundred miler either, but at the same time, I mean, literally like a, couple band-aids some vaseline that was it wow and um you know people would kind of trip and fall or something that was really like the main thing that i saw the first year i was there and i kind of talked to andy like gosh it just seems like there should be a little bit more like if someone really got hurt out here it'd be kind of dire and then what and then what happened is when they went to a hundred miler the race directors approached the uh, University of Nevada, Reno, the sports medicine fellows about doing medical coverage and the sports medicine phone contacted me and he had this, he had been reading about how to cover marathons. So he's like, we're going to have aid stations every three months, medical aid stations every three miles. And I was like, dude, you've never done a trail race. Like time out. This is not a road marathon. Cause, but what, you know, because he had been reading about road marathons. I said, no, this is a different beast. So, um, yeah, between Joanne and UNR, that's how I got involved. So, wow. yep. That's amazing. So, today, um, I, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through some scenarios. And some of this, like, came up, you know, kind of off the top of my head. Um, some of it came from other questions from, from other runners. 
Um, but you know, just as your as your gestalt, how do you how do you see the ultra marathons like are going to be run before we have a vaccine or you know any sort of effective treatments? Yeah. I don't know if they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the races will happen. I, I I don't have a doubt of that. But how how we how how do you think we could how do you think the races should be done? To make them safe during this time. Well, yeah, I, I um, it's a good question. I, I, I think there is going to be some racing. Um, I think I, I kind of wonder if some of the what's going to happen is we're going to see sort of smaller, more regional races to start out. Um, you know, just I think people are still going to be under some travel restrictions, so the idea of you know, flying halfway around the world to go to a race. I kind of wonder if that might, if that part of it might go away for a while. Um, and then I, you know, I, I kind of hope that people, we sort of start out maybe with some smaller distances, you know, not start out with a hundred miler, yeah. um, just to kind of get a sense of how things need to work out. Um, but it's, and, and obviously I think we'll probably see races with just, in general, less people. Um, you know, I, I do wonder. You know, you read about New York and Boston in the fall, and, and I, you know, I mean, I guess if they're able to pull it off, we should be able to pull it off on the trails. But I'm sort of watching to see what they do there. Yeah, and and they probably they did that. You know, before we saw what was happening in New York and what we've seen before, they that was they were pretty early to that. So, John, yeah. what do you? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Andy. I think that the, um, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll have some races later on in the year. Um, I mean, I don't I don't think I mean, obviously, anything for the early parts of the summer and probably the late late parts of the summer are probably not incredibly realistic. But um, I think the one of the bigger things that that we'll see and that'll that would be safer just just smaller numbers every everything in general being smaller both the number of you know runners that are able to race mm -hmm. plus the number of you know volunteers kind of slash aid stations kind of so kind of decreasing the amount of people that are involved in, yeah. in contact with each other on a on the whole scale from the runners to the you know again to the race organization to the i mean it's not as big a deal in 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 ultras as it is in in road marathons but the spectators as well i think mm -hmm. we just have overall small numbers and whether that means that you know everything becomes a little bit smaller and more regionalized or it's just um you know limited you know limited amount of people that are allowed to participate i'm, I'm not sure but i think that'll, that'll be the, the most glaring thing i think we see when we come back is just everything will be smaller yeah what you know in terms of safety you know, you, you, each of you brought up some good aspects of the of an actual ultra marathon. So you have the the racers, you have the volunteers, and then you have the spectators. And and I kind of throw the crew in as sort of another kind of group of people. You know, of those, like where do you where do you worry the most about like how you know the race itself could you know unintentionally spread the virus. Yeah, they froze there. Yeah. Um, Those domains. John, frozen on your end there, Andy. Yeah, he's frozen on my end too. Oh, am I still frozen? Uh, yeah. Are oh, you better now? <laughs> okay. Did you hear my question? Um, I think so. I think I think I have the, the gist of it. Yeah. Just um, yeah. There's like, you know, four, you know, four groups of people. You have the racer, you have the volunteers, and, and then you have the, you know, the people running the race, and then you have the, the, the crew and pacers and, you know, um, like, how do you, is there any aspects that you're, that worry you more in terms of uh, COVID-19 right now? I mean, I think from a, like, from a race management perspective, I think the hardest to control would actually be the kind of spectators and crew, yeah. because I think you can be very thoughtful about the way you 
put your volunteers out um, and in terms of you know having either appropriate distancing or just appropriate protective measures and I think you you know again with kind of how you start and finish the race or kind of your big crowds with the race itself getting people spread out and, and personally I think that um, you know the risk of transmission from running and running near somebody is incredibly low yeah. um, and I just I think that like the 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 crew and spectators that's when you have to tend to have people congregating for longer periods of time and closer yeah. proximity and just something that's a little bit beyond your control um andy what your thoughts yeah i mean um you know and then i you know i think john's right just sort of the longer people are close to each other the more you're going to worry about transmission and then mm -hmm. you know obviously i think you know, what we may end up seeing is, um, well, I, I worry about the runners just from the standpoint of the stress of the run and what it may do to your immune system. And again, yeah. you know, especially if people are, you know, it's one thing if you're drive, driving an hour to the race by yourself, but if you're having to, you know, run a long, you know, run a 50 mile race and your immune system gets knocked down and then you're flying on, a, you know, flying on an airplane back on the other side of the country, um, I kind of worry about that group a little bit. Uh, and then obviously the older volunteers, mm -hmm. runners, crew, just because we know, you know, it seems like, you know, COVID tend to, it tends to hit people who are older harder. Yeah. And ultra marathons tend to have a slightly older crowd who's attracted to it as well. Um, yeah. So in, did, you know, in, in terms of the, uh, you know, things I I I concerned with you is very is very similar. That you know, it's it's the other thing too is like running these races safely and be able to have to be able to do the races. I'm wondering if you know the insurance, you know, the insurance plans or assurances for the race, the getting the the permits. I'm wondering if they're um, going to start having any their own kind of regulation on that for these races i don't know if you either of you've heard anything about that but that that's a question that comes to my mind is that you know the in order to get a race insured are they going to put that on their own kind of expectations with running a race it might be kind of beyond our, our discussion here but something to think about well you know especially in places where uh parks and trails are closed to the public now mm -hmm. I just wonder how is that going to, um, you know, is that all going to open at one time and um, are, are counties and cities even going to want to host races? Who knows, yeah. right? I mean, not like yeah. what they be liable for. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah. maybe they just are like, you know, we just don't even want these people. We don't want crowds. We don't want too many visitors. Yeah, but you know, it sounds like um, at least with some some races, they they were you know are, are you know trying to see if they could even reschedule it. So hopefully, there's you know if we can show that we're we do it in a safe way, that we can you know hopefully keep those community partners and state and park reps uh, partners with that. The, you know, in terms of like general safety for for you know our medical volunteers do you are you gonna are you thinking about doing anything different um in terms of western states or broken arrow have you had any back of the envelope thoughts about that of how the you know, guideline for safety if you're sitting in an aid station for hours and hours for next year yeah for next year when I'm Western for, states happen, I'm for a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, no, I mean I, the Brits have one they're doing on already. So we, it, I, I'm, I'm kind of bullish on a vaccine. I, I don't know by 2021, but I'm, I'm bullish on it. Yeah, I, I, I mean a vaccine would just simplify things so much. Obviously. Um, you know, without a vaccine, I, I, I've been having some thoughts, um, you know, some of the COVID testing now is actually, I think, going to be, I mean, 
one of the biggest issues is we haven't been able to get testing now yeah. you know um i think the idea of uh people getting testing so i mean you know i i could see especially some of the maybe some of the bigger races might say like hey we need proof of a negative covid saliva to the race before we're going to let you in there um and that's not going to be a hundred percent but you know um so i i think it'll be interesting to see what i mean i there's so many variables right now that i think we don't know but i think you know if the price of testing comes down a little bit becomes more available yeah um, you know that's one of the thoughts i've had is maybe the runners have to give us either proof of immunity or, or proof of a negative pcr test yeah I mean, I think that's that's an interesting even for for the racers or the volunteers or or both. We might have to do all. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. I I also feel like there's already after you know these six weeks. I'm sure John, you've seen it in the ER, sort of more widespread acceptance of universal precautions when wearing masks. Where like I don't even want to walk from the parking lot to the hospital right now without my mask on. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that, um, you know, we never wear masks in the medical tent, but you know, I, I don't, I don't think it would be crazy to think like if you were actually interacting with a runner who needed, I mean, even blister care to, mm -hmm. cause you're in this close proximity for a certain amount of time, you know, wearing, wearing a mask, um, you know, it's the hygiene part's really difficult out there. Um, yeah, and that, but, and, that um, and I think that's in, what yeah for sure. That kind of begs to, like, um, do we have PPE for that? Do we have the supplies for that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think anything that happens this year, um, I mean, I I don't see a way that you couldn't have. I mean, that you couldn't mandate you know the, the volunteers to wear masks um i mean i don't know that the racers would or if they would you know have to wear a buff when they came in the thing have to put it on like that but i think you would at least have to have the volunteers you know including medical volunteers for, for this year wearing a mask and it's kind of hard to say you know looking forward to next year what things will look like um i did you know i just had a thought as you had mentioned that the vaccination i was interested in your your guys' thoughts on this is if so supposing um you know we have vaccine you know by next winter and so 2021 season vaccines available um you know would would you ever foresee a situation where you would require a vaccine to require proof of vaccination to participate in a race similar to you know schools or something like that i, I mean it's yeah. obviously not happened to this point because i don't think we've seen it you know quite such a widespread pandemic but um i just had that thought when when you had mentioned the vaccination I'm curious to hear your guys thoughts about no. what that look like to, to me that sounds reasonable stuff for, especially for like a big race that draws people from all over to to be one way to sort of have your own mitigation because it if people get the vaccine they're not going to come to your race uh, but I could imagine like a big race like about Boston or UTMB or Western States, um, a Broken Arrow. I mean, it's a big race. People, and that's a big race. You know, um, it draws a lot of because I, you know, the, even I think Joanne, you had shared that that um, article or, or that white paper about you know in you know an analog out of Wuhan. It seemed like outdoor events didn't seem to be a big um accelerator of infections compared to indoors um but you know i do think uh, mardi gras is a little worrisome for me because that big outdoor parades and that definitely was an accelerant so i think i think it's like a combination of i think mo most general outdoor gatherings are probably okay but maybe something like coachella or boston marathon where everyone's like packed in four deep for miles um that would be you know something you know where you'd be con you know concerned um but yeah so many variables i think smaller races um 
you know, and and to to, to mandate vaccines might be a, a big pill for them to swallow, though. Depending on, I mean, California is probably okay. We're kind of used to it. I mean, get yeah. used to man <laughs> mandatory vaccines, and but and um, I have another thought about vaccines. But I'm just, you know, Andy, do you have any other thoughts? Well, you know, I also wonder, I mean, I think that, the, again, for the races that have international runners, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be interesting if and when there is a vaccine, you know, I, I could see proof of vaccination being required for people to enter other, you know, I, I mean, we love going to Italy, and my guess is if there's a vaccine, the next time we go to Italy, they're going to want to see something saying, hey, I've been vaccinated against this before you show up to, you know. So I can see a lot of countries wanting to see that for international travel. Um, no, I mean, it's it's something that, again, you know, either proof of, proof of vaccination or proof of antibodies might be something we need to add. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me take a look at some more. Would you do anything different at the finish line? Gosh, that's, that's <laughs> difficult. I, you know, I think what like, thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, it's so interesting because I think, you know, when you, when you think about some of the things that the, you know, the, the trail running or ultra running community kind of, you know, really, when you think about the community itself, I mean, that, that's part of it is the community and, you know, this, the, you know, the, the run itself, but also the celebration of the run with, you know, with, you know, with your friends or with the people you meet out there. And that is, you know, I, Gosh, I mean, again, I think, you know, for this year, I think like, you know, if things do happen, I, you know, definitely things will need to be scaled down. And I, you know, I doubt there will be big, you know, like award ceremony sorts of things that you might like at UTMB or something like that, where they've got mm -hmm. thousands of people that are, um, you know, there, um, you know, as far as the high five at the finish or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you just get some hand sanitizer and high five and then hand sanitize i guess yeah. but you know in well, terms we, we were laughing about that with ethan at broken arrow and ringing the bell. uh or <laughs> oh, yeah hard, i mean kissing the rock at hard rock i'm like <laughs> well, you know i mean yeah. uh i mean there's some ultra running traditions there of um which i'm like oh how are they gonna do i mean it? so much time goes by in between kisses right I've thought about that before at Hard Rock because you're like, I mean, literally an hour before, right. like, you know, puking going, you know, divide or whatever. Then you're like down at the rock kissing it. And you're like, oh, I, I don't know who came before me who's after me here, but they're going to get a little bit of that. Uh, you know, gel that I just threw up. But. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's not like ultra running has ever been a particularly hygienic yeah. scene. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think it's only only saving grace from a respiratory point of view is that it is outdoors and you're not spending a huge amount of times in right. proximity. It's not like wrestling or MMA right. or something like right. that like, right. in someone's face. Yeah. Um, what, um, you know, it I sounds like one of the things that's really struck me from our discussion is that you know, the, this, this, you know, the coronavirus really in, affects almost every aspect of an ultra. You have to really think about almost every, from your entry list to your, you know, to getting health information from patient, from the from racers, um, how you, you know, the size of your field, the support staff, all of that sort of, you have to, we have to think about it now in the light of, of uh, coronavirus, which is different. We don't think about flu season. I mean, there's lots of races during flu season and things like that. And we're not freaking out about it as much. 
yeah. I mean, even you can even back up further, I'd say, in into to training and to kind of piggyback on something that Andy yeah. earlier is that, you know, I mean, personally for me, I'm I'm while I'm you know continuing to run and train, I'm not putting you know a six hour day in or like a you know extremely strenuous effort just because you know the the you know the the recovery time for your body may not you know if you, if you happen to get sick in that recovery time then i don't know so i think even backing up into training it, it right currently with you know with how yeah. things are be a little bit mindful of that um just not to especially yeah. you know folks like all of us that are you know certainly at a higher risk for exposure exposure and you know, there's a lot of healthcare professionals who participate in ultras and volunteer in ultras, and not just in giving medical care. Um, I mean, I think one thing that um, you know, in hearing um, an explanation from Craig uh, and Andy about some of the, the thought process and why they decided to cancel Western states this year, I think was really thoughtful. Was it's not just that can we do the race safely in June? You know, um, it's more, what are we, you know, what are we kind of, what kind of unintentional effect are we having on our participants to say like, we're gonna heat this race open and we're not gonna tell you if we're gonna cancel it, we're just gonna wait and wait and wait until we're mandated to cancel it. Um, and so it creates this enormous pressure for people to train when maybe, or even, you know, when they in, they're in shelter in place or they have, you know, regional um laws or saying that they can't get out and train and also just like you know the this the part we don't understand this infection very well and it does seem to affect younger people it's not just you know an older adult uh, infection you know people in their 20s 30s and 40s can get very very ill from it and we don't understand why um, they get ill and and to do something that may you know pull essentially put a lot of stress on your body and, and you know is something also I think races have to think about when you know having a race you know, like what what can you do there can you one can you have the race safely and two can your participant participants train safely for it as well yeah and I you know I, and, and we talked about that at states I mean if if it was a uh... It was beta breakers and it was a 12k i mean people can kind of train up for that pretty you know it's a, it's just a different beast but we, yeah when you're asking someone to put in the training for a, a 50 50k 50 mile 100 mile um and yeah and really you know the the that there's health recommendations to stay in place right now for a reason and, and to sort of ask people to try to get creative and you know, and, and I think even, I mean, I heard a lot of stories about that, even at the Olympic level that, you know, a lot of the Olympic swimmers, you know, the part of the reason why the Olympics got pushed back is a lot of the Olympic swimmers were like, we can't get in the pool right now. You know, I mean, there's just, mm. and there's, there was like really no way for them to train. So they're like, why are we going to have a race if, you know, so yeah, I mean, I think those are some of the things that that we just kind of need to see how things play out over the summer with all that stuff. Totally. totally. Right. Um, oh, do I? No, nothing you else. Is great. Well, let's, um, I mean, uh, let's try to end this on hopeful. Um, what, what are you, you hopeful for of all of this? What's the bright side? Well, I'm hopeful that there'll be some treatments. I think, you know, a vaccine, I, I agree with you. I mean, I want to be optimistic that there's going to be a vaccine that works for almost everybody, and then it will be produced in huge quantities that everybody can get. But, you know, that could take years. But what would be great is if we had better treatments, like early treatments before people got really sick, so that finding out that you got this thing wasn't necessarily this really awful yeah potential awful outcome um yeah i mean i think that that might be a little bit more promising there are just a couple studies out today on you know treatment 
protocols. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I wish we had a better handle. Again, it comes back down to testing. I wish we had a better handle on just how many people have been in, infected, how many people have been exposed, how many people have recovered. Can you get infected again? We just need so much more information. And it's just so hard to make predictions without really any, hardly any data at all. But I'm hopeful that we'll go out and run again, even just for fun. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, mean, I, I mean, I will say just in general, from a, you know, from a um, more global sense out, outside of running, I mean, it has been incredible to really see everybody coming together like all over the world it's I mean, the, the response to it is really you know pretty heartwarming especially you know for, for us in, in medicine it's like wow it's i mean people really can come together and and it was, it was it's been pretty cool yeah. to see that now there's you know been some exceptions here and there but in general i think it's really been a a, a great time of unity um you know i think from a um you know from a from a running perspective you know, I do hold a, a glimmer of hope that we'll we'll see some racing later in the fall, and again, maybe in a smaller scaled back version. Um, and I think too, you know, it's it it gives everybody kind of this chance to kind of run for running. You know, yeah. there's not there's not a race, and there's not like something really to to train for, other than you know, just kind of training for for life in general. And so it's like, you, you know, I think it's that's and i think it seems like too it's it's drawing more people at least anecdotally it seems like you know more people are out enjoying the outside you know and that's because it's the only thing you can do uh, at yeah. least right now it's like a, you know go for a run on the road or the yeah. trail or whatever it is but um you know it's that's it's kind of an interesting thing to see so but you know i think i, I I'm, I'm hopeful it's you know we're we're obviously kind of move, I think moving on into the dance portion where, you know, things are going to flare up and pull back and flare up and pull back. And we'll just have to, as long as we've got the, you know, the appropriate testing and the appropriate kind of resources that we need to kind of bring things back down, just have to be willing to accept that, um, you know, while we may be able to go out in, you know, two months in three months, we may not. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Andy, what are you um, You know, I, I, I would sort of like to echo it. I mean, there's been a lot of, obviously, a lot of downsides to this for a lot of people. And, but um, I, I would agree with John. I mean, just the, the amount of uh, really creativity within the medical community of, okay, we don't have enough PPE. What can we do? How do we, you know, here, uh, we're not in a perfect situation. We don't have the right testing. We don't, how can we optimize testing? How can we opt, you know, so it's been, I mean, it's been really some of the, the work that my colleagues have been doing um, that I've been seeing in our local community and, and nationwide of just the, the, the creative solutions um, make me hopeful that we're going to continue to have some really good creative solutions. Um, you know, I'm also optimistic looking at, you know, what's happening in your, you know, I've been looking a lot at what's happening in Europe and, and especially Italy, they're starting to loosen up on things. And, you know, I was reading some things the other day of, you know, uh, what's it going to take to get soccer back in, in Europe? Um, and is it going to happen? And um, There's some thoughts that it might. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sort of watching a lot of the, the pro sports right now and, and seeing, you know, obviously they have deeper pockets and more resources, but, um, you know, there, there seems to be, I, I don't think anything's said. I, if I had to bet, I'd still bet we're not going to see the end of basketball and hockey this year and, um, football. And I would probably bet against right now, but, um, but Again, there's a lot of creativity there, so and there's a lot of money. So I think yeah. they, they may be coming up with some solutions because they have a deep enough pockets to to come up with that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll. I, I'm, you know, generally I'm, I'm hopeful because I think like like what John said and and really you know what uh, 
you and Joanne also said, Andy, um, one, this, this, this calamity has brought people together much more than it's divided. Um, I think that has given us an opportunity to, to think about, you know, what we're doing, not just for the next race or the next, you know, whatever in our, in our, in our lives. Um, and I've been really, really impressed by how people are, are trying to, you know, pay, you know, follow these guidelines. Like I'm, you know, personally, my, you know, I was very shocked how, how much people are taking it seriously here in Sacramento and, you know, across this country. And to me, that, that shows that, you know, there is some trust in our health system. There's some trust in our public health care system that people don't, you know, and, and that kind of ability for us to work together as a country, I think, is, 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 is hopeful. Um, I'm hoping that testing will will improve. I know there's a lot of point of care devices and instant uh, devices. Uh, some places they're opening up where you can just go to a pharmacy and you need a doctor's appointment and you can get tested. Um, and then I, as Joanne said as well, I think there's, there's probably better hope in pharmaceuticals as well. So um, overall, I think we'll be, you know, it may take, you may, it may take, Hopefully it takes shorter, may take longer, but at some point we'll, we'll be back racing again and either participating or helping out with these ultras. But I you know, really um, just wanted to say thank you both, uh, all of you for participating in this and, and talking to, to us about this, um, but also for the countless hours that each of you have dedicated to helping people finish these races safely and all of the energy and enthusiasm that you bring uh, to the sport. Certainly, it's one of the reasons why um, I really love the ultra community. So. Thanks for putting right. this on. Yeah. That. Okay. <laughs> all right, we're done. I'll stop recording. Yeah. Well, that was a great discussion. Um, I think in many ways, it's really the beginning of many conversations and including not only us as you know healthcare providers, but really the whole community at large on how we can safely um, go back to running on the trails and hopefully gathering together uh, at ultra marathon and trail races soon. Please uh, let me know uh, what you thought about the discussion. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, let me know either on YouTube or on any of our other platforms. And um, I hope you all are staying safe. Thank you for listening. This video and podcast represents the opinion of Dr. John Onate and his guests. The content is provided only for informational, educational, or entertainment purposes. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions or concerns. Views and opinions expressed by the host and guests are our own and do not represent that of our place of work. While we make every effort to ensure the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or corrections of errors. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient relationship. I do not receive any income or gifts from the pharmaceutical industry. I have no financial conflicts to disclose in relationship to the content presented, and if I do, I will present at that time. Thank you.